Thank you for watching Sahara TV. My name is Essay Alumase. I'm joined today by blogger, public speaker, and columnist Japheth Amojua. Welcome to the show. Oh, what brings you to New York City? I came to attend the course, Atlas Leadership Academy, and then I also had a presentation at the Intercontinental um, Hotel, and then also to go for a, um, a conference in Canada, and oh, then wow. see some other friends in Boston. So just to jump right into it, uh, mm -hmm. the 2015 elections are approaching. Um, what's the biggest challenge you see in Nigeria going toward that? I think obviously um, that's terrorism, the insecurity issues. Um, it's always going to be difficult to have elections with the sort of reality we, we find, especially in the northeast of Nigeria, um, with people practically dying every day. And uh, when you look at the response of the government and the security forces, and nothing, you know, there's no respite in sight. So that's that I think is a major challenge. And if I look away from the obvious major challenge, then I'd go to INET and its readiness. Except maybe they're doing something behind closed doors. If we judge them based on the PVC collection, collection of water scar and all of that, I, I think they are not ready. And the elections are under four months. Um, so we're in November, the elections are in the middle of February. So insecurity and the readiness of INEC would be the major challenges going forward for the elections. So I guess in light of that, there is a lot going on in terms of politics. Yeah. Um, Given the candidates or the people that have made themselves prominent in the upcoming race, who do you think is best fit or best suited for the position of president of Nigeria? Uh, best fit or best suited? I'm not going to decide that. Nigerians will decide that. But in terms of the people with the chances of becoming president next year, um, obviously the incumbent, um, no matter how well you think or how badly you think he has performed, is the incumbent. And Africa being what it is, especially Nigeria being what it is, these guys are going to put their hands in the national resources and they're going to use all the money. You see what they're doing with the transformation, um, whatever network and um, time. So they have access to cash. It's going to be a major, it's going to have a major say. Um, that's the president. Um, secondly, obviously, General Muhammad Buhari. Um, he's been there, done that. He's a serial um, candidate and he has this large pool of followership. Um, whether it's able to translate that into finally winning the elections is um, something as well. Of course, that will depend on how he's able to um, get more votes away from his regular um, area of strength, which is the northern part of Nigeria, and how he's also able to get the president not to have a um, sizable number of votes that helps him to win outrightly the last time. Uh, another factor is um, Atiku Abubakar. Um, he's having a very, um, very, very good campaign, especially when you look at his social media communication. I think it's, um, it's brought something different to the table in terms of um, focusing on issues and focusing on policies and, you know, designs, working with young people. Um, impressive campaign. Whether that would help him um, supplant General Buhari for APC, the different um, ball game entirely. You'd also have to pay attention to the governor of Kano State, um, Governor Kwakwan. So he has a massive following in Kano and, and environs. And, but I don't know if he would be able to pull that much followership across the nation. So Kwakwanso would look like some sort of um, potential um, candidate for the future. And then the, the Greenhorns would be people like um, the former chairman of leadership newspapers, Sam Nda Azaya, and then some other people, um, Okorocha, um, the governor of Imo State, um, Governor Adam Soshemole. These, these are people that are rumored to also um, want to get in the game. Um, outside of these people, I think um, nobody else in the game for now. The other ones would look like pretenders. So if the incumbent, President Jonathan, were to win again, what issues would you like him to tackle more aggressively? Or what do you think might be different given his uh, re-election? Uh, what issues would I want him to tackle more aggressively? Uh, first of all, it's not a question of aggressiveness. It's a question of whether he's really, really committed to getting these things done. He's had some five years um, by next year to deal with these issues. But if he can and he's, if he's interested and if his um, followers, his team are interested, they have to look at uh, the insecurity issue. If they've been trying to solve this for the better part of four years and it doesn't look like we're anywhere close, then they might have to do something differently. And they might have to start listening to people that think that they can do better. Only today we heard that hunters were the ones that beat Boko Haram out of um, one of the captured areas. So, and that's obviously in today's world is unconventional. So they might have to start thinking differently. Maybe these hunters know um, these Boko Haram insurgents better. Maybe this is when we have to start thinking of state policing and all the conversations around it. We can't, we can't just lock up and say we don't want to hear about these things. Of course, the economy, there's a lot of noise about um, 
seven percent six percent growth rate but we can't forget the fact that this growth rate has not really translated to food on the table for the average nigerian the poverty rate irrespective of what they put in their um, performance and publications the poverty rate remains extremely high all you need to do is just go around the street and ask questions people that used to have ability to feed themselves and their families and now send text messages and begging for food so that area has to definitely be looked into they have to understand that education has nothing to do with building more schools education is looking at the economy and looking at whether what we are supplying from the universities are solving the problems that the economy is asking today that's not the, that's not the issue the economy is asking the question that the educational system is not supplying. So we have to look at our educational curriculum and whether we even want to have a national curriculum. Uh, another part, we have to look at the issue of our, um, our Nigerianness. Do Nigerians really want to be together? They had a sham national conference. Um, I think it would be better to have something much more encompassing, something much more um, not in control of, of the president as, as this other one was. This was more or less like the president gathering people together to say have a conversation. I think it would be better to have, maybe not, uh, someone like Oguda Misi will say sovereign, I don't know, maybe that's pushing it too far, but something that looks very obvious that um, the agreement will be binding on all and sundry. The current agreement is, has just ended up being just another paper. I, I'm sure there are other issues. It's not, it's not difficult to look at what we have to do, and really and truly, um, the solutions are not that difficult. I think the biggest challenge we have is whether these people are committed to helping Nigeria grow and develop and helping that development reach to the people. So what's the ideal political setup or the ideal group of people that you feel should be in charge of politics in Nigeria? Is it a range of ages, a range of people from different ethnic groups or different religions? What exactly does that picture look like for you? I, I think the ideal thing for Nigeria would be to find a way to get competent people into government. So sometimes politicians win elections, but nobody says that they have to be the, the ones to run the economy. And the fact that I, as a politician, have won the election to be president does not mean that I have to get a politician to run the central bank or to, a politician to be the, um, the um, um, what's it called, the minister of finance and, and all of those things. So it's us understanding that while technocrats will find it difficult winning elections, politicians can win elections and then get out of the way to let technocrats, people that went to school, people that spent their life learning how to fix economies, fix the economy. I understand that there was a minister that was appointed as minister, and four months after I was asking a presidential aide, what am I supposed to do in this office? We don't want to find ourselves in that situation. I mean, in terms of making sure power spreads across the country, um, that might not look ideal, but it's a necessity because we are in a very, very diverse um, system a lot of politicians a lot of people would always play on that diversity on that difference so the, whoever is in charge of nigeria whoever is running our country has to pay attention to these differences to these you know the nuances of language of tribalism and find a way um, ethnicity and find a way to make sure that everybody at least has some say i mean there is no tribe in there is no ethnic group in nigeria that, does, that doesn't have a competent person to fit into some area that nigeria needs somebody to to fit into so it's paying attention to those those dynamics you cannot ignore the dynamic irrespective of whether you want to have competent people in the right places you cannot ignore the fact that nigeria is, a, is in a unique position in terms of making sure that the, the, the you know the muslim christian argument the north south argument the outer Igbo and minority minority arguments all of these questions have to be answered interesting um so you touched on social media you're very influential actually on social media um, statistics have recently cited that uh, Nigeria, well, they highlight that Africa is a very young continent. The median age in Nigeria is 18 years old. So what role do you think, a lot of young Nigerians are on social media, what role do you think that can play in politics, in life, and everything going forward? Uh, there are two ways to it. It could be a disaster going forward, and it could be a beautiful thing going forward. Um, the advantage that China, China has in terms of jobs and everything would, would eventually be wiped off in the next 20 years because most of these people are going to grow old. Um, is Africa able to supply that needed labor? Numbers will not be enough. We would need them to be competent. Um, of course, it will always be cheap to get labor. So th there's an advantage in terms of the fact that Africa could supply the labor of the world in the next 10, 15, 20 years. 
But are we equipping these people to be able to meet up with the demands of the of this century? I don't think so. So we have to pay attention to making sure that we don't just have numbers, we have quality numbers. And that's where human development has come into um, government policies, not just Nigeria, but you know across the continent. I'm interested in the continent because I've had access to um, being with young people and having conversations with young people across the sub-Sahara. What does it do to politics? It, it, it then means that young people have the ability and the power to influence who leads them. Um, whether they are able to look beyond, you know, getting paid a few um, change to, you know, carry ballot papers and, you know, become talks in elections is another thing. Um, but you see, we can never have a youth party. If we have a youth party to just be on paper, maybe two or three young people gather themselves together. Based on what I've seen over the years, um, it's always going to be difficult to say, let's have a youth party. Um, we should also find a way not to think that being a young person is a currency. Being a young person doesn't mean that you are able to. So we should focus on our, our own competence. Um, when you look at the young people all around the world, young people are the ones, you know, we talk about Twitter, you talk about, um, you talk about Facebook, you talk about Apple. Young people are actually running things in, in major um, countries of the world. We can also use social media, which is one of our strongest points, to influence how we want ourselves to be go um, governed. We could map out um, challenges across our, our continent, across Nigeria. We could also find a way to map out the solutions. We could find a way to document these things, to put these things in documents, to make them into policies, to find a way to engage the ones that are in power, to also find a way to support the young people that are in government, find a way to make sure that they uh, do not become what you know they used to preach against. It's, it's unfortunate that, um, especially where I come from in Nigeria, a lot of people you know, sh scream, shout, eventually they get heard, eventually they get, uh, you know, conscripted into the system, eventually they more or less become like what they used to um, speak against. So if you can find a way to make sure that we keep people like that on their toes, so that eventually, um, the more we replace the old guard, the new guard does not become like the old guard that filled our continent. The new guard does not become like the old guard that filled our people. But we can't afford to abandon these young people that are getting in. We have to find a way to continue to connect with them. So there are two ways about it. Um, opportunities, if we manage it well. Um, dangerous, if we don't manage it well, because if you say you have 10.5 million people um, outside of the school system, as Nigeria does, you don't need to be bothered about where the next set of Boko Haram terrorists are coming from. They're just right there on the street. So we have to find a way to you know, plug all these gaps and pay attention to the dynamics of terrorism, insurgency, um, social, um, social issues, and, and again, um, more importantly, don't forget that the family, which is the smallest unit of everything, has to be dealt with. So we must find a way to make sure that um, government is able to cover up the challenges of education, especially at the foot of the ladder, primary education, and then able to make sure that those that are not able to advance into um, universities have access to tertiary um, vocational um, education. I agree with what you said. Youth isn't a currency, but I think... Um you can look at examples or you can look at situations in other countries where young people have come together and they've made massive impact. The most recent example I can think of is in Burkina Faso. They recently overthrew their leader of 37 years. They're a much younger country. Their median age is 16 years old. So what's the disconnect? What separates Nigerians, their bigger population, a larger group from Burkina Faso or from similar groups who have issues with education, unemployment, and such? What is that difference? Where is that disconnect? Uh, Nigeria and Burkina Faso may be both um, West African countries, but the, the realities are not exactly the same. While the young people in Burkina Faso were dealing with a, a somewhat, not a dictator, but a dictator more or less, um, who had been in, in power for 27 years, so they had a figure, they had a target. This person, Blaise Compare, is the target. We were going after him. In Nigeria, it's not as much like that. Nigeria has never had a leader that was, that was, their lead, that was the leader for 10 years. But you know, since 99, the so-called Fourth Republic, even though we've not had one person lead us since 99, which is just still about 15 years, we've had the same set of people. So from being a governor, this person goes to the Senate. And from being, from being in a House of Rep member, this person goes to the Senate. It's still the same set of people still para, um, you know, roaming around the corridors of power or right there in the room, the, the very um, center of power. It's difficult to identify who the enemy is in this situation because while it was easier for them to see Blaise Compare as the enemy, in Nigeria, who is the enemy? Jonathan, for instance, would go in 2019, another face would come in. You know, so 
they had that advantage that they could easily identify the enemy. For Nigeria, it's difficult to identify the enemy. Um, that is not to say that young people in Nigeria, are, young people in Nigeria were the ones that more or less, you know, went on the street to make the current president, acting president in 2010, um, the enough is enough um, protest. They were the ones that stepped out in 2012, along with some other people, um, the full subsidy protest. They are the ones more or less at the forefront of making sure that young people are represented with respect to um, the elections, with respect to um, voter registration, education, using these tools of, um, you know, new media, even conventional media. So they are filling up spaces. But the reality in Burkina Faso is not like Nigeria. If we had a leader that had been there for 27 years, it would be very easy for us to look at this person and say, okay, yeah, you're the enemy. But in the case of Nigeria, the enemy has too many faces. We don't know who to start with. But is there a length of time that warrants that kind of outrage? People can't just be outraged, you know, after one year or two years of issues or things staying the same and also falling apart. Is there a length of time? Like, you're making it, I feel like I get the impression that because Burkina Faso had a leader for the same person for 27 years, that's a recognizable face. But 15 years of one party rule, 16 years, doesn't, what warrants the outrage? Where's the point that we say, oh, this is an issue or this is not an issue? Where, where does that line get crossed? The democracy gives, in Nigeria, democracy gives us a kind of drug that gives us um, a feeling that we're part of the system, that we can change the system, we can change the government. So every four years, there is this hope that gives you an, an impression that something different is going to come. It looks good on paper, so we have a chance to change, to change who is in power. But that also makes you feel like there's a solution. So it's, it's always going to be difficult to say Nigerians, because again, in, in the next four months there about, they have a chance to choose their leader. But do not forget that when you have the combination of poverty and illiteracy, which combined a very, very negative force. It's always going to be difficult for them to choose the right leader. So what day will they finally decide that let's face the enemy? Do not forget there is ethnicity. So we, you decide the enemy is the current president in power. There are people that come from the area of that president who are going to say, no, there was this guy from your area. He was also just as bad. You guys didn't fight against him. Nigeria is a different kettle of fish. The population of Burkina Faso and the population of Lagos are probably more or less like the same thing. And Lagos is just one over 37th of, of, of the reality of Nigeria in terms of our um, state division. So they, they're not the same thing, trust me, they're not. So do you think that there's, you know, before we wrap up a solution, you know, do you think that there's going to be a point or a method that wraps this up? For Nigeria? Yeah. The solution is to find a way to fill up leadership positions from the bottom up. So we ensure that we get the right people into the local government, and that's happening already. A lot of young people that were part of the movement, in the, the you know recent movements, are actually going to national assemblies. Some of them are um, trying to be um, local government chairmen. And then also the dynamics of the world, whereby leadership all across the world, people a Nigerian knows that a president has to come out to debate now because they have access to you know DSTV, they have access to t um, Twitter, they have access to Facebook. They know that it is not. Um, the president is not doing us a favor if he makes himself available for debates. And they also know that service is about delivery. So they also know that if the president of my country doesn't do the right thing, we have to start asking questions. So I think going forward, we'll be influenced by global realities that leaders have to do better. And who says it cannot happen in Nigeria? It could happen. Anything could happen. See, the most difficult thing to predict is the future. When Burkina Faso happened, four days before then, nobody thought it was going to happen. Three days when they stepped out on the street, they didn't step out to remove the president. They stepped out to stop him from changing the constitution himself and the National Assembly. But three days after, it was removed. So you never really can tell when it comes to predicting the future. We just hope that something good happens to Nigeria. So my last question is, what projects are you working on that people should look out for? Yeah, uh, the first one, Niger Things Project, we're trying to keep... Um, children in school in Abuja and um, paying their school fees. We are also trying to get professionals to come to their schools to be their regular teachers because most of these schools don't even have teachers and where they have teachers, the teachers are, um, with all due respect, but the teachers are mostly incompetent. And the other side of it is um, I'm starting a think tank. One of the reasons I'm in America, I'm trying to talk to partners and also get some understanding of how to run a regular think tank that will be focused on educating the masses and also focusing on um, producing policies of, for national development. So those are the things I'll be working on 2015 down to 2020 by God's grace. Thank you for that. Thank you. That again was blogger, columnist, and public speaker, Jafet Omojoa. Thank you for joining us. On My the pleasure. Show today. Thank you for hosting me.